Um, Sam, what will happen to Magan? He was unbound. He'll try to kill the apples. Mother, Illyrio, we haven't got the ring to bind him again. Maga has long avoided her. I don't think we need to worry about Maga anymore. Kind of implies what? Maga's not alive. Maga's dead. Okay. But it's not what he means. Notice, Maga has long avoided her. She's been looking for Maga for a while. Thousands of years. Sam, um, what do you mean? Because Sam's trying to wrestle with it. How can a free magic spirit die? Notice, they didn't kill Aronis. What did they do? They bound it. Then I'll give this away. She's rebound at the end. Okay, I'm not going to say how or anything yet. But she's not destroyed. Why? How are you going to destroy the destroyer? Okay. So Sam asks, but Lyriel kind of wants to ask a, a more basic question. Who is she? Because she's understanding, okay, so she's been after Maga. Let's assume for the moment she has Maga, and Maga's not coming back. So who is she? What can be more powerful than Maga? Because they've now seen Maga. It won't help you to know because you can't understand. Why can't they understand? puny little human brains. She doesn't really exist anymore, except every now and then, and here and there, in small ways and small things. If we had not come this way, she would not have been. Like, she, she wouldn't have been there if we'd never come down. But because we came down, she was there. And now that we have passion, what? Tell me, you know who she is. And she taps her nose against Lyriel's seventh bell, and a single slow tear rolls down her snout to Lyriel's hand. Why? Why the tear? Well, she just touched the bell, right, with her nose. What's the bell? Astrael the Sorrowful. The most frightening bell of them all, the one he had never even touched in his brief time as custodian of that, sound, of that set of bells, says Sam. Okay, so seven is Astriel, so that means seven can't be Kibbeth. Sorry. Yep. Is six Kibbeth? Yeah, I think so. Uh, go back to the, well, what's the, is Kibbeth number three in the listing of the bells? Yeah, Kibbeth is three. So what's the sixth one? Sarah, find her. Okay, so seven is Ast. Astorail. That's Sarah. This is Kibbeth. Okay, I have a question. Okay. So if the five represent those five, and the seven represent the bells, do the nine therefore represent the nine gates? Ooh, interesting question. Oh, I never thought about that. Because there's nine. Yeah. So therefore is Mog at the eighth gate and like the dog is the third kind of thing. Part of the third. And therefore, the destroyer is the last gate, and you can't go past right. the destroyer. Could be. Which would be really interesting because of what... I don't want to give it away. Because of what happens when you do go into the ninth precinct. It's not that you're... You can't come back up. It's true, you can't come back. But it's not that you're annihilated. It's not that you are destroyed. In fact... We get a we see somebody who's kind of tripped on his back. And he's been this person's been hiding his face from up here because the person knows if you go in the ninth precinct and you look up, you're gone. Because of what you see. And what you see isn't, you know, the engulfing mouth of hell. You know, it's trying try to get you it's a it's a beautiful, peaceful image. And in fact, what we're going to see is this person who does it and sees this happen has tears down the person's face. It's, it's an interesting image. I won't say of redemption, but it's, it's almost like a cleansing um, image. So, the weeper, Lyriel lets the dog go. 
Because now she's starting to, what are you then? Why did Astoreo let you go? I'm the destructive old dog, a true servant of the Charter and your friend. Okay? And Mogget, she's, she's killed him? No, says the dog. So I can ask you a question. Yeah. Did the dog make him go there for that? Because he is a servant of the Charter and she is part of the dead Charter, right? No, she's not. Oh, she's not. That's she's why free now. She is outside the Charter. Go back to what he said. She's what's left over of Quebec. You talking about the dog or Estoril? The dog. The dog's not bound. The dog's not. The dog. The dog did not go into the charter. The dog is what's left over after mm -hmm. all of these years. That's why the dog says, "You know, I'm." I'm this and that and nothing all at once. And, and later on, I mean, the the dog's going to tell us I'm Kibeth, okay? And and, and Lyriel's going to say much much later on, "But you told me you weren't." <laughs> And he's going to say, I lied. That's why I'm the disreputable dog. You can't trust my reputation. Okay. Um, no, what I was getting at earlier was when page 65, it is, her, it is her fate knowing that her knowing self will be forever outside what she chose to make, the charter that her unknowing self is part of. See, Estherail is kind of now bifurcated. Part of her is in the charter, but that's the unknowing self. The knowing self, the conscious part, is forever outside the charter. It's, it's like once they made the charter, they can, at some point in the future, empty the rest of themselves into it. It's already taken care of. So was it like seven celestial beings made the charter? I, do, I don't know what you'd call these things. There's just, there's They're just essence. referred to as spirits, elemental spirits, okay? And if you think about it, I mean, elemental, yeah, okay. Um, walking, waking, sleeping. So those are both actions, um, weeping, emotions, okay? Destroying, anger, hate, you know, things like that. And, I mean, you could probably, I'm sure somebody's probably done a doctoral dissertation on, on what these things are. Uh, me, okay? So, Lirio asks, Sam asks, page 68, about the dog, about Mogget, and the dog says, no, he's not dead. What dead? It's not for us to know, says the dog. Our task lies ahead. Mogget lies behind us now. Okay? So they go on. They keep talking as they walk, because they get outside and they realize what seemed like hours passed by. It's only been about an hour. And the dog says, page 70, time and death sleep side by side. Both are in Astoreo's domain. She has helped us in her own way. Okay. That implies what about Astoreo? Consciousness. Consciousness. Well, I mean, her conscious self is outside the church. So the part they met down there, that was conscious. But he's implying, kind of on our side, it, it's good to have death on your side, you know. <laughs> Especially when you're dealing with all the dead, as we're going to see later on. You're going to see more dead than, you know, you can imagine. Okay, Skip a bunch again. Um, page 76, 77, Sam's talking to Lyrio. <clears throat> and Sam says, It's strange, you know, since I learned that you were that person and waiting, not me. I haven't felt afraid. She's probably thinking, Yeah, because you don't have to go into death. <laughs> I mean, I've been scared, but it wasn't the same. I'm not responsible now. Well, he kind of was irresponsible before, too, but that's not what he means. I mean, I am responsible because I'm a prince of the kingdom, but it's normal things I'm responsible for, not necromancers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He doesn't realize he's digging a hole. And the sendings gave me this surcoat. See, this is the real point he wants to get to. The fact that I'm not Abbors, it doesn't mean I don't have a job. The lawmaker's trowel, they gave it to me. And I've been thinking that it's as if my ancestors are saying, it's all right to make things. Hmm, you think? 
Because think of what Claire, uh, Lyriel's ancestors did. Oh, a thousand years ago. They made an entire room with a bridge and put three little items on a desk for someone who would show up a thousand years later. That's what I'm meant to do. Make things. And help the ab person and the king. So I'll do that. And I'll do my best. If my best isn't good enough, at least I'll have done everything I could. Now I'll give you a little clue for one of the paper topics. That's an idea that comes again and again and again throughout this book. Doing what you can. Even if you don't think it's much. We're going to even hear Nick say, Later on, when he's nearly dead, because Lyriel gets through to him and she plants this idea in his mind, to do what I can. And even Timothy Wallach, his friend, who's also helping build the, the lightning farm, do what I can. Even though he's fighting off the dead and he's an angel steer and he has no magical abilities. All right? At least I will have done everything I could, everything that is in me. I don't have to try to be someone else, someone I can never be. Ah, he's just learned, accepted what? The exact same thing it takes Terran five books <laughs> to learn. That he is Samoth and not somebody else. Okay? Skip a bit more. Uh, uh, page 86, they come to the top of the steps. They're climbing up these steps cut into the wall by the cliff. And the closer and closer they get to the top of the steps, the more and more Lyriel feels the presence of death, as does Sam. And they find these bodies, okay? And Lyriel looks at one of them and says, I knew that guy. And it was the guy we met at the beginning of the second book. The guy who comes up and hits on her, essentially. I mean, he doesn't really hit on her. He's, hi, my name's Bera. You are... <laughs> no. It's her 14th birthday. And she's crying because she's not a seer. He's thinking, she's kind of cute. Let's go do what the clear, you know, naturally do with these fly-by-night kind of guys. So, they put them to rest. Okay. And after they do, page 90... Both of them, they immediately recognize, both of them recognize what it was at the same time. The acrid, acrid metallic odor characteristic of free magic. Faint, couldn't tell where it's coming from, perhaps the gully, etc. And it's kind of interesting because Nix introduces a creature here that we don't see ever again and that seemingly has no purpose. Other than to provide a little bit of complication and a little bit of, you know, suspense. Like, ooh, they might get eaten by some earth-like creature, because that's what it is, okay? So they kind of make it go away, and um, chapter 5, page 96 and following, the dog tells them what it is. It's a pharynx. Shouldn't be one here. Elemental creatures, spirits of stone and mud. They became nothing more than stone and mud when the charter was made. A few would have been missed, but what are they doing here? Okay. So they keep talking about other elemental creatures that should have been gone when the charter was made, but there are a few, like the Stilkin and things like that. Okay. But he looks at some of the dead, and he says... Um, Something that killed some of these people wasn't human, and it wasn't a dead hand. It was another elemental type creature. It might have been, page 97, a twin Jarek, but I'm inclined to think the killing here was done by two Hish. Okay? Now, we don't know it yet. Take that back. Yes, we do. Is it the first book? Where do we see, or is it the second book? Where do we see Clor meet up with Hedge? That's the second book. Okay, it's in the prologue. Right? What does Clore have with her? She's got those two creatures, right? And she says, I'm going to leave these here. They're going to be guard. I'm going to go down into that tunnel. And if anything funny happens, they're going to take care of you. Well, the hedge is like, yeah, let me try. Okay? That's what these are. 
read Clario, and you find out all about them. Because we get Clore's whole backstory in the book Clario, which is set 500 years before this. Okay? It's really good. So, they talk about tracks and signs and things like that. Um, so they do the cleansing. And let's skip a bit. They come up with the rainstorm. And the dog tells them about the little bit about the thing that um, page 107 that Hedge is uh, digging up and, and the dog starts to put kind of signs together he says um, she says sorry the dog she says top of 107 that storm would not answer to any weather magic and they're talking about the storm that they can see off the distance over where the where the lightning is hitting. There's too much lightning that confirms a fear I had hoped to lay to rest. I had not thought they would find it so quickly or that it could be so easily untuned. I should have known. Astorail does not lightly tread the earth and the pharynx released already. That is, the dog is saying whatever the pharynx is, according to Sam and Lyriel's minds, the pharynx come out because of what's going on over there. The reason they met Astorail down in the well is because of what's going on over there. That is, things are stirring because of what's going on over there. What is it? The thing that Hedge is digging up, says the dog. I'll tell you, no, tell you more when needs must. See, now, if I were them at this point, I would say needs must. Now, what if an opportunity doesn't arise later? We need to know the information we need to know. I do not wish to fill your bones with fear or tell ancient tales for no purpose. There are still several possible explanations and ancient safeguards that might yet hold even if the worst is true. Well, doesn't that just kind of, you know, raise the fear level? If the dog's kind of afraid to even talk about it, you know, like kind of like the thing that must not be named, okay? So they keep going on, and they find a little hut. They lay down and sleep in it. The dog gives them, you know, uh, allows them to sleep. He'll take watch. And we're told, page 113, a league or more down of the shepherd's hut, a very short man, almost a dwarf, was paddling in the shallows. His skin was white with bone. The hair on his head and beard was whiter still. I'll show her mother's the albino, 2,000 years of servitude already. And then to, then to what? Grabs a fish. Page 114. The rope was fastened around the little man's waist with a red leather belt. Okay. And where the buckle should have been, there was a tiny bell. All this time, the albino had held it, using only one hand to catch the fish and clean himself. But his caution failed when he stumbled on a slippery patch of grass. The bell sang out as he fell to a knee. <sighs> and he yawns. No, 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 sister. I have work to do, you see. I cannot sleep. Not now. The sister? Rana. The bell. See? The implication is not relation in the sense that we think of relation, but they're kind of co-equals as it um, sibling celestial beings, you know. So he says, I've got to keep, keep going. He can't sleep. So, chapter 6. We see heads, we see the hemispheres, or the semihears, however you want to pronounce the word. And we see Nick, page 118. Nick could see a pattern, bottom of the page. Each hemisphere was struck, notice this, I've never noticed this before until I was preparing for class today. Each hemisphere is struck eight times in a row. And then the ninth bolt misses. 
What is it with his author and numbers? He's obsessed with the numbers. A lot of authors. A lot of authors like numbers. Just look up numerology. Okay? But nine is a is a very important number in um, especially kind of medieval Christian symbolism. I mean, you got nine circles of hell in, in Dante, you've got nine circles in purgatory, you've got nine levels of heaven. Uh, according to a, a document written in about the fifth, sixth century by a guy named Pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite. He's not the Dionysius that St. Paul refers to in the book of Acts. This is, that's why this thing's called Pseudo, who wrote a book called On the Celestial Hierarchy. And it's from him that we get the whole hierarchy, the ranks of the angelic beings, and the names of some of the angels and such. Okay? But nine's, nine is a very important number. Okay? So, Nick notices all this. And he and Hedge are talking back and forth, and they've got to get a barge, etc. And we're told, as they notice the rain, Hedge says, this should not be. Summoned rain coming from the northeast. I had best investigate master. Now, when he refers to Nick as master, is he talking to Nicholas Sayer? No. No, he's talking to... And then a strange pain struck him, Nick, excuse me, yeah, Nick, in the chest, and he doubled over. What is it, master? Fool, said the thing that used it, Nick. Now is not the time to seek our enemies, because what does Hedge say? I'm going to go find who's causing the rain. You're not ready to me. <laughs> we got to get these together. Okay? You must procure an additional barge at once, load the hemispheres, get the holy, get this body out of the rain. It's too fragile, blah, blah, blah. Okay? So, skip a bunch. Um, page 130. Lurial and the dog are going to go into death. To find out where Nick's diggings are, what happened to this guard, because they meet a guard from a royal guard that um, Nick uh, that um, Sam recognizes. Okay, and they want to find out what happened to her and what she can tell them. Dog says, "I'm coming too, right?" She goes, "Oh yeah, you're I'm not going in by myself again." So Nick's got to protect them. Okay, so they go into death. And page 135, they meet the guard, Marin. She tells her, I'm abhorsing and waiting. I know, I look like a Claire, but I'm really abhorsing and waiting. And Marin tells him about the necromancer of the pit. Uh, excuse me, of the pit. He killed my companions. He laughed to let me crawl away, wounded as I was. Servants would find me, bind me to death, etc., etc. They say, where's the pit? She tells them. And then she tells them about Nicholas. And then she does something else. Send me on. Why? She doesn't want to be called back. She doesn't want to be a slave. So, she takes Kibbeth, rings it above her head in a figure eight pattern. Kibbeth is what? It's the walking one. So, she kind of points her in the direction. Keep heading that way. And rings the bell. Go, Mary, and walk deep into death, and do not tarry or let any bar your path. I command thee to walk to the ninth gate and go beyond, for you have earned your final notice. Rest. And jerks around, and she goes. So Sam walks around the perimeter where they are, and there he hears and sees something. Page 145. He goes after it, and it's a strange enemy. An enemy, a strange, pallid little man. The albino dwarf, okay, who disappears. Lyriel and the dog come back, wake up, and we're told 146. Sam makes it back to the small clearing. Lyriel stood there, icicles from raindrops hung from her outstretched arm. Frozen pool around her feet had spread, so strange in this warm forest, she was unharmed. Oh, lucky I was here, says a voice, Morgan's voice. Where are you? Here, regretting as usual, Sam did not relax his guard. He could see that Morgan still wore a collar. There was a bell on it. And he's like, eh, I don't trust you, though. 
I saw a man. Uh, yeah, that was me. The dog said that she, Asterail, wasn't going to let you go. Notice, Sam still has his sword up. Like, why are you here if she wouldn't let you go? Moggett yawns again. The bell rings, and Sam realizes, okay, it's got to be the real Moggett. Is that what that hound said? Okay. Page 148. Lyriel tells them what happened in death. And Sam says, you really are the head horse I've been waiting now. I guess I am, she replies. She felt as if she claimed something when she'd announced herself as such in death. And lost something too. One thing to take up the bells at the house, another thing to do it in death. Her old life seemed so far away. She felt uncomfortable in her own skin. Notice, Sam is the one who now feels comfortable in his skin. She's still a little uncomfortable. By the time she gets to the end, it's kind of like, Sam, real, go away. <laughs> we don't need you anymore. We no more of this ab horse in, in training, you know. We'll be two ab horses. Because at the end, Lyriel's the one calling all the shots. I mean, it's Sam, real, like, yes, ma'am. Well, essentially, she's in the middle of training herself, kind of like Sabriel did in the first book. Because she might have been read the book like her dad told her to, but she had to train herself and he died. Yeah, but she had been trained before then. I mean, she he'd come visit her twice a year. Yeah. And he made her read the book and practice, and that's why she started, you know, she went into death the first time when she was 12. She first pushed the first Morden back when she was 14, 15. Well, Lirio, I mean, she's still 19. <laughs> I mean, time hasn't, a lot of time hasn't gone by, so she's a quick learner, okay? So, the dog says, I smell something. Sam, well, it's Moggett. <laughs> Moggett came back. I think it's Moggett. He's in my pack. Dog goes up, takes a sniff. Paw comes out to slash him. It's the Moggett, but I don't understand. And Moggett says, she gave me, page 150, what she chooses to call Another chance. Why another chance? What were we told earlier about Moggett? I think it was earlier. I think it was in the previous book. Why? He didn't want to be part of it. He didn't help them make the charter, and he didn't have anything to do with this. He was forced to help them out to find that one. Did he, he help? Yeah, I don't think he helped. He didn't help. I thought he said he was forced to. He didn't it was, help. It was seven that bound. It's seven against the nine. Yeah. He did not help. It's these five plus Estherail and the dog, even though I know the dog's this one. Okay? It, but it's the, it's it's them, it's the seven against number nine. Moggett is not involved. Which is the big spoiler for the end, okay? Because it takes Margaret to help. They can't do it without her or whatever, okay? So she chooses to give me another chance, more than you've ever done. Now that kind of implies that Margaret was bound first. Or oh, chance of what? There's no time for your games. Do you know what's being dug up? I know. I didn't care then. I didn't care then. I didn't care about binding. I mean, my is telling us. I didn't care about binding it then, and I don't care now. What's Margaret really saying? Above my pay grade. Not my problem. It's the destroyer. The unmaker. The unraveler. Say the name. Not in anger, not when we're so close. Close. So the dog comes up, approaches Sam's back, leans over it, careful to stay out of the striking distance, and says, Margaret, you are still bound to be a servant of the half horses, aren't you? Yes. Notice, Margaret was unbound in the well. Margaret is now bound again. Astoriel did the binding. So you will help us, won't you? No answer. <laughs> Sam says, I'll find you some fish. A bribe, you know, a bribe always helps, okay? And some mice, Lyriel offers. 
even though she doesn't like mice because she's a librarian, they eat books. And he says, and birds, songbirds. She goes, nope, no songbirds. You can have mice and fish, but okay. They get ready to leave. They put the mark on the tree where they essentially, they don't really bury Merid, but where they freed her soul and sent her on, okay. With, a, with words so that anybody who comes up and touches that mark, they'll hear these words. Marin died here far from home in France. She was a royal guard, a brave woman who fought against the foe too strong. She will be remembered, blah, blah, blah. The fitting gesture says the dog, and a, and Moggett says, stupid one. Fairly stupid one. Okay, why? Because the dead are coming. We don't have time for this. So they go on. The dead, yes, yeah. Well, especially Hedge if he's coming. Okay. So, page one fifty six. Sam and the dog are, and Lirio are talking, and the dog says they're dragging two silver hemispheres three hundred paces apart. Each hemisphere, he's explaining now what he wouldn't explain before, imprisons one half of an ancient spirit. Her voice was very low, a spirit from the beginning, from before the charter was made. The one you said to jump to Margaret not to name? Yes. In prison long ago, trapped within the silver hemispheres, and the hemispheres were buried deep beneath wards of silver, gold, and lead, rowan, ash, and oak, and the seventh ward, seven wards, because the seven were involved, and because seven is another major number, seven, according to numerologists, magicians, and such, seven is the perfect number. I mean, the perfect number. I have no idea about this. I, I'm not one of the initiates. <laughs> um, so, Sam, it's still bound? Uh, they might have dug up the hemispheres, but it's still bound inside them, isn't it? For now, where the prison fails, a little hope can be placed in the bonds. In other words, the dog's kind of saying, it's going to be loosed. Okay? Because the destroyer is still bound, page 158. We just have to stop those hemispheres joining, or whatever it is Heads plans to do with them. Sam, we should rescue Nick. A lot of dead down there. Lirio, that's it. That's it. That's why the clear had division. I've got to get to Nick. Me, Nick, on the boat, in the pond. Okay? So... Moggett says, in response to Lirio's plan, she likes she plans like your mother too. What are we supposed to do? Walk down there and ask Hedge to hand over the boy? Sam starts to say something. And we hear, don't be silly, Moggett. We'll rest for a while. I'll put on a charter skin I made on the boat and fly down as an owl. The dog can fly down too. We'll find Nick, sneak him away. You and Sam can follow us down. We'll rendezvous near running water. Problem with that plan? Sam, I don't know that you should be the one to go, okay? Dog says, nope, she needs me the one to go. First interlude. Touchstone's hand clasped Sabriel's shoulder. They're not dead, okay? For a little bit, I thought they were, they came back from death or something. Oh, well, I mean, she's that horse tonight. I'm glad they did uh, okay, so chapter, we're going to skip the rest of the interview, chapter 9. Nick's dreaming. He wakes up, and there's an owl perched on his traveling chest and a dog with wings. And he's thinking, man, I'm really out of it. The dog says, there's some of the destroyer in him. We're going to skip some of it. It's eating away at him. So they talk with Nick. And page 177. The destroyer starts to awaken, and we're told, very bottom 177, notice Nick starts to glow. How dare, uh, I should have expected you, meddler, and one of your sisters, get one of your, the other seven, get quick, Lirio, Rana and Serenef together with my bark. So the destroyer calls out. Hedge curses, turns aside. 
So she pulls out the two bells and the dog barks, and we're told the sound wraps around Nick, page 179, but a raging will fought against the spell. So Nick collapses, they pick him up, and they take him out. Page 180, the disreputable dog barks, all the dead hands shriek and howl. Free magic assaults them, forces them to walk back into death. Chapter 10. While they're away, Nick has to deal with, or excuse me, Sam has to deal with Hedge. Let's see here. Let's pick up with Moggett disappears again. Page 189. The dead hands are coming, and Nick sees uh, Sam, excuse me, sees Hedge covered in, you know, flame and such. Sam shoots a chartered, charged arrow at Hedge, page 190, hits him in the head. A blue spark, uh, the arrow flew like a blue spark. Sam watched it with hope as it sped as true as he could wish. The arrow met Necromancer with a blaze of white fire against the red. Hedge fell from his skeleton horse, which reared, sorry, didn't hit him in the head, just hit him. And then dived forward, smashing through several ranks of dead hands to plunge into the water in an explosion of white sparks. Notice the horse dies its final death. Moggett, that'll annoy him. Hmm. Meaning, what's worse? A lion that's unwounded or a lion that's wounded? You, you kill it or... Okay. Moggett says, don't waste more. He can't be killed. Hedge comes up. Steam now coming off him. Okay. Sam's thinking, I should run away middle of 192, but he buried that thought away, sending the nagging voice so far into the recesses of his mind, it was just a meaningless squeak. He let the charter marks he already had in his hand fall into nothingness, reached into the charter again, and drew out a whole new string of marks, marks of protection, reflection, diversion. Okay. He looks down for 10 or 15 seconds, and Hedge has disappeared. Margaret says, uh, Sam says, where were you? Hiding, like any sensible person would do, when confronted by a necromancer like Hedge. Is he that powerful? You must have encountered many necromancers serving my mother and the other abhors. They didn't have help from the destroyer. I must say I'm impressed with what it can do, even bound as it is. Now, notice what Margaret has just said. Pretty powerful, even though bound, he says, I'm impressed. I'm impressed usually means what? Is it that you're scared or, you know, there's a little bit of admiration there? Yeah. I mean, there's, the, there's that touch of admiration. Okay. I mean, we're going to hear even more of that later. They're going to go, you're not going all wobbly, kind of, are you, you know, Margaret? You're not going to su support her this time, are you? Him, it, whatever. Chapter 11, hidden in the reeds. So, Lirio and Nick get in the weeds. The dog's a little bit away. And we're told, 198, 199. Lirio's trying to get Nick to see, to understand about all these, what's he call them, the night workers or something? They're dead. The night workers, they're dead. Okay. You have them working in your pit. And he goes, come on, Sam's off into that magical, you know, stuff. Um, you saw me as an owl, Lirio says. You saw the dog with wings. Come on. Page 199. Nick, as you can see, I'm not well, which is another reason I shouldn't be in this, this. And Lirio says, hmm, it must be the thing inside you that has closed your mind. That is, the destroyer doesn't want Nick what? To believe in magic. To acknowledge what's real. So to prove what you mean. So what else might that say, for example, about the people in Enchelstier? Is the destroyer kind of, um, what's the word for some beneath the earth? Um, subversively at work there so that they don't think there's any such thing as magic or so that magic doesn't work. Why is it, I mean, if these are elemental beings, 
celestial being, you know, that made the charter. How come there's no magic down there in Angel's Gear? Why is it only in the Old Kingdom? Because it's part of the wall, which is the perimeter, which is well, the barrier. For the wall was made by them. How the hell did that? Well, we're not, you know, it sounds like they're the source of quote unquote creation. For everything or just yeah. the Old Kingdom? No, it sounds like they're the source for everything. I don't know. It's never said. That's never alluded to. I thought Uranus was on different things, destroyed different places, and then finally, once they were at this world, they decided to stop her. I I mean, maybe, I mean, when we get up to there, but I don't think that's actually said. Okay. Okay. So, Nick goes on and talks about what he thinks the hemispheres are. He thinks they're going to be a source of what? Power. Power. They, you know, if they're going to be, you know, nuclear energy today, you know, what what some people are looking for, you know, nuclear fusion energy, not fission, which is what we currently have. Fusion, totally clean, no problems, kind of a thing. Okay. It's my intention to connect the hemispheres two hundred to a one to a lightning farm, and blah blah blah. So Lyriel asked him a question. How do you know? How do you know what you think is true is true? That's a pretty basic question. How does he really know this will work? He doesn't. But he says, well, I'm a scientist. That's why when the hemispheres are in angel's gear, I will be able to prove my theories. No, he'll be able to test his theories. Test and prove, by the way, they mean the same thing. Test and prove both mean the exact same thing. They both come from medieval alchemy. They're alchemical terms, okay? So what's he mean? I will test my hypothesis. Well, what does the scientific method always say? If the hypothesis is false, the experiment will fail. If the hypothesis is true, the experiment will succeed But how do you then know whether or not it's true? What must always be able to be done after that? It's got to be repeatable, which is why whenever there's some new scientific breakthrough and a scientist or group of scientists publish their study, they've got to publish all of the data so that other scientists can try to replicate the experiment. And if they can't, then there's usually something faulty in the data. Okay? Only problem here... Joining the two. And we're going to see the image that is given us is what? Those of you who gotten to that part. You have a great big tall tower of white light and then what happens? A big old ball on top. Oh, you mean so? I was it's a describing a mushroom? Yeah. It's a, yeah. It's a mushroom. It's a. This shows you how sick I am. I just love watching old videos of nuclear explosions. I mean, <laughs> especially, you know, look at the. Which one is it? It's Mike. It was the largest um, hydrogen bomb that the United States ever detonated. It's just amazing. It's not nearly as big as the largest one the Soviet Union detonated. Was that one was like 150 megawatts. Our largest one was like 80 something. It was somewhere out in the Pacific. Wasn't it called like Tsar Bravo? Or is that, that was, I don't remember. That, that was the Russian one. Is it Mike Bravo? Yeah, I think it's Mike Bravo. I just watched it a couple yeah. weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's just totally amazing. So, Big Boy was Kurosh. Yeah, Little Boy Fat Man, sorry. Um, so, why do the hemispheres have to be brought together? She thinks that's the weakest point of his belief. Okay. They, they just have to be. It should be obvious he doesn't have any reason why. I mean, they're hemispheres. What well, you expect? They go together somehow. Okay. So he tells him, tells her how they're going to do that. Um, he asks about you know what relation you are to Sam. She says I'm his aunt, and he's like, cool, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
page one, excuse me, page 209. So they keep talking. You're still on the boat. The dog is still gone. And Sam starts to feel that feeling. And Lariel says, uh, Nick does, Lariel says, fight it. Nick, you have to fight it. I'll try. His eyes show white. A little bit of smoke comes out of his nostrils. Fight it. You're Nicholas Sayre. Tell me who you are. I'm, I'm Nicholas John Andrew Sayre. I'm Nicholas, Nicholas, and he tells where he was born, where he lived, where, you know, all this kind of stuff. She says, you know, recite stuff that you remember. 211. I'm in trouble, aren't I? He looks down at the bottom of the boat. Yes, but Samoth and I and our friends will do the best we can to save you. But you don't think you can. <laughs> Notice he's being honest. This, this thing inside me, what is it? I don't know. But it is part of some great and ancient evil, and you are helping it to be free, to wreak this. Notice, she doesn't go, oh, it'll be okay, Nick. She says, no, you're working with some great and ancient evil to destroy the world. He nods. It's been like a dream. Most of the time, I don't really know whether I'm awake or not. I can't remember things. What is that telling us? How many of you have read the Harry Potter novel? Okay. Second Harry Potter novel, Chamber of Secrets. And the fifth Harry Potter novel. In the fifth Harry Potter novel, Harry for a while believes that he is being possessed by Lord Voldemort. Ginny Weasley pretty much conclusively teaches him, you're not being possessed by Lord Voldemort. And he says, how do you know? Well, because I was possessed by Lord Voldemort. So you tell me what your experiences are. Do you remember blocks of time? Are there blocks of time for which you have no memories? No, then you were possessed. Because I had big blocks of time where I didn't remember anything. Nick is being possessed by this. Possessed in the kind of Christian -y sense. Okay? So, he says, it's okay, okay, 212, I've got it under control. Tell me what I have to do. Keep fighting. If we can't keep you, then when the time comes, you must do whatever you can to stop it. Promise me you will. I will. Word of a sayer. Well, it kind of turns out his parents, his father and his uncle, they're, worth, they're not worth very much. Why? Well, partly because his uncle's been influenced by Hedge. Okay? I'll stop it. I will. Talk to me, please, Larry. Oh, I have to think about something else. Tell, tell me, where were you born? And so she tells him. And then she goes on and she mentions, I'm Sabriel's sister. Not by the same mother, you know, complicated. So I didn't know my father was the Abhorson. That's like saying to Satan, didn't know my father was Jesus. You know, Abhorson, and he convulses. She's like, shoot. Smoke pouring out of his mouth and nose, white sparks flickering, right? So the destroyer is freed from Nick. She is thrown out. Sorry. The destroyer frees Nick. She is thrown out of the boat and such. Okay. Page one, uh, 216. Fool, your powers are thin. Hand me down to pit against me. I almost sorrow that Sarenith and Rana live on only in you and your trinkets. The trinkets are that, is that the bells? Pan pipes, blood. Okay. Why is the one on in Muppets? Well, think, I mean, I almost saw that Sarah and Rana live on only in you and your trinkets. In you seems to me to be saying Claire and Air Forces. Okay. And the trinket would be the bells. Bells, probably sword, you know. So the destroyer leaves her, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she tries to get Nick in the lake. She does make the boat rock. Nick falls in. Um, let's see here. I'm going to skip a bunch. 
page 225. She's reunited with the dog. She tells, uh, the dog says, hmm, so it rose again and neck. That didn't take long. Even the fra fragment must be stronger than I would have thought. Lyriel's let a lot stronger, okay? Chapter 13. So the dog goes on, page 229. They're now reunited with Sam. And she tells Sam there's a fragment of the destroyer in Nick. What do you mean, a fragment? Inside him now? I don't know. Yes, there's a sliver of the metal. So where's Nick? I don't know. On the barge with Hedge. Okay. Page 230. They're going to bring the two halves together down in the old, down in Anchelstier. Lirio said, Charter knows what will happen then. The dog says, well, I know. Total destruction. The end of all life. I suppose it's time to tell you exactly what we face. But let's find some place defensible first. Okay, so they go and they find a place. In the dog page 232 and following says, the destroyer was known by many names, but the most common is the one that I will write here. Notice, I'm not going to say it. It is the name that must not be named, so don't. Do not speak it unless you must, for the name, even the name has power. And so he writes down. O-R-A-N-N-I-S. Lyrial. Who or what is this? Come on, tell us. It is the ninth bright shiner, the most powerful free magic being of them all. That's why it took seven to bind. The one who fought the seven in the beginning when the charter was made. Notice the eight doesn't mention that. It is the destroyer of worlds whose nature is to oppose creation with annihilation. Long ago, beyond counting in years, it was defeated, broken in two, each half bound within a silver hemisphere. Those hemispheres secured to seven bonds buried deep beneath the earth, never to be released. Destroyer of worlds implies that he has destroyed the worlds. Mm -hmm. So that didn't go. Damn. Wouldn't. No, that they're not the creators of. Yeah, I mean, yeah. But we never, were never told that there were other worlds. Yeah. You know, um, Robert J. Oppenheimer, the day of the Trinity explosion, the first atomic bomb, looked at that and immediately realized the genie's out of the bottle and said, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I think he said, I am Shiva of death, the destroyer of worlds, quoting the Bhagavad Gita. And then work kind of the rest of his life to try to, you know, put the genie back in the bottle. The dog says, it's still bound. We're okay right now, kind of. Why didn't you tell me this before? Because you are not strong enough in yourself. You did not know who you are. Well, she does now, right? Because she became really a person when she was in death and sent Marin all the way through. That was the first time she's done that. Right? Now you do, and you're ready to know fully what we face. Besides, I wasn't sure. Moggin, I knew. <laughs> Ages ago. So they keep talking. Nick will enable the destroyer to join the hemisphere to become whole. If it does, then everyone, everything is doomed on both sides of the wall. Moggin, it was always the most powerful and cunning of the nine. It must have worked this page 235. It must have worked out that the only place it could come back together was somewhere it had never existed. It is in Anchelstier. And then somehow it must have learned that we infringed upon a world beyond our own. So I guess, yeah, I was totally mistaken. These things apparently only exist in the Old Kingdom. For the destroyer was bound long before the wall was made. Clever, clever. Sam, you sound like you admire it. Not the right attitude to have right now. Oh, I do admire the destroyer, but only from a distance. I can't remember. Was it this class that I talked about? You know, growing up in California, always wanted to see a tornado. 2010. Mm -hmm. They're not fun. I, I'm fine. I don't need to see anymore. <laughs> I'd still like to see, you know, an alien from a distance. <laughs> a long distance, you know, but... Oh yeah, I'd love to see from a from a distance, you know. 
but only from a distance. It would have no qualms about annihilating me, you know, since I refused to ally with it against the seven when it gathered its host all those long lost dreams ago. That is, he didn't join with number nine, but he didn't join with number seven either. What did Moggett, whatever the real Moggett's name is, Uriel, try to do? He wanted to play Switzerland. Uh, neutral. Only sensible thing you ever did, though not as sensible as you could have been. What's the dog mean by that? He could have been good or how he does. Neither for nor against. I love that phrase. I would have lost myself either way. Not that it helped me any in the end. Here I am, a furry cat, you know. Choosing the middle road, for I've lost most of myself anyway. Well, lack of day. Life goes on, there are fish in the river, and the destroyer heads for anxious deer. So what's your next plan? And a person in waiting, she goes, I'm not sure I have one. I do have a couple of questions, though. If the destroyer joins itself back in together in Anchel's Deer, can it do anything? That is, if all you guys are really real here, or in the old kingdom, what can it do in Anchel's Deer? I mean, both charter and free magic don't work on the other side, do they? Sam, it fades. In any case, the destroyer is a source of free magic in itself, says the dog. Should it become whole and free, it could range wherever it wills. Though I do not know how it would manifest itself beyond the kingdom. We're not told how it would manifest itself in the kingdom. He's saying, I don't know what form, shape, power it would take outside the kingdom. But he is saying, it doesn't matter where it is. Where does it where did the ending of the book take place? I thought it was in the old in, in Anchelsteer. Okay. Yeah. South of the wall. The wall alone would not stop it, for the stones carry the power of only two of the seven. It took all of them to bind the destroyer. Larry, okay, that's my next question. Um, how was it split in two and bound? That is, okay, you guys were there. Moggett didn't wasn't involved, but the dog was. So how did you do it before? How did you defeat it and split it? Maga, I was already bound like so many others. So notice it's not just the nine. Beneath this rank, let's call it, there's apparently a bunch of other elemental levels, like the Stilkin, the Ferenc that we heard about, the Hish, the Jebbek, and all those other little things, okay? Moggett says, I was bound just like all of those things were. That's why when we saw the fairy, the dog said, it shouldn't be here. That, that, should, that should be earth and stone. Is that the one that was in the library? No, that's the Stoken. That's the Stoken. So it's creatures like that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, besides, Moggett says, I'm not really who I was even a millennium ago alone what I was in the beginning. A dog, the dog says, in a way, I was present, but I too am only a shadow of what I once was, and my clear memories all stem from a later time. I don't remember. I don't know the answer to your question. Lariel's thinking, there's a passage in the book about remembrance and forgetting. I think I know how to find out, though I don't know whether I'll be able to do it. But i got to get clean first. What's it going to take? She's got to go into death. How far into death does she have to go? Almost all the way. Past the eighth gate. To open the book and open the mirror. And rewind the beginning. Okay. So, page 241. Little thing, little cake, tiny detail. Sam pulls out a coin. Lyriel's eating, and he pulls out a coin, tosses it in the air, it spins up and up and up, and just when it should come back down, it floats there, still spinning. He watches it, sighs, clicks his fingers, and the coin drops in his hand. What is that? Oh, you finished. And she 
been eating. He's been waiting for her to finish so that he could talk to her. It's a feather coin. I made it. What's it for? Nothing. It's a toy. It's for annoying people, says Boggett. Mm -hmm. I suppose it does annoy people. This is the fourth one I've made. Mother broke two. Elamir caught the last one, hammered it flat. <laughs> so it could only wobble about close to the ground. Anyway, now that you've looked. Okay. So Lyriel says, what do you think we should do? Despite everything, Sam appeared to be less tense and nervous than she expected. Perhaps he'd become fatalistic. Eh, we're all going to die. <laughs> And wondered if she had as well. Faced by an enemy that was so clearly beyond them, they were just resigned to do whatever they could before they got killed or enslaved. But she didn't feel fatalistic. Now that she's clean, she's got a little hope. So why is it important that he throws that stupid little coin up and it just hangs there in midair and he says, it's a toy? What's it an example of? Something he's created. He's a maker. Okay. It's kind of like the frog. It's exactly like the frog which is why he's going to become so important at the end, okay? Page 246, Lirio says, is it possible to enter death on the other side of the wall? That is, the side we're on. Sure, Sam answers. Depending on how far in you are. I mean, if you're closer to the wall, yes, definitely. Well, what, what, what are you gonna do? I gotta use a dark mirror, look back into the past, okay? So they try to go to the wall. Skip a bunch. Um, page 256-57. Mogget decides to tell Lyriel, oh, by the way, I have a message from your mother. He's been with her for months. Well, maybe not months. A while. Your mother, she left a message. Is when, the, isn't the sleep getting with the wind? When she was at the house. Um, yeah, it might be that, that that little amount of time. But she's no she's known Margaret since the previous book. Which was the same time period as this. Because she left the yeah, clarity. Yeah, a little book. bit. Yeah, okay. A little two weeks maybe. It <laughs> it sped up more more than the um, no, the previous book, from beginning to end, has a four-year span. Yeah. First part is because it's the when she was young and it's 14th married. year of King Touchstone and then the 18th year. Once right? they reach yeah, that age, she doesn't meet him until 18. And but she leaves the glacier, and there's a lot of time after that. She leaves when she's 14, or is she, no. It starts when she's 14, she leaves, now she's 19, 20, 21, something like that. So, anyways, she's like, what? And so he tells her. Ariel saw me with you near the wall, page 257. So why didn't he tell her before? Because he's Margaret. Because he's Why else? Because now they're going towards the wall. In other words, this is going to happen, this thing that she told me. She was sitting in her paper wing. I was handing her a package. I had a different form in those days. Probably wouldn't have remembered this if I hadn't taken that shape again. Funny how that happened. So he gets to the message. I hand him the package. She's looking into the mist above the waterfall. There's a rainbow there. And she says, you will stand by my daughter near the wall. You will see her groan as I will not. Tell Lyriel that, that my going will be, will have been no choice of mine. That is... That it's not my fault that I won't know her. I have linked her life and mine to the ab portion and put the feet of both mother and daughter on a path that will limit our choosing. Tell her also that I love her and will always love her and that leaving her will be the death of my heart. Okay? But when she hears Margaret, she hears her mother's voice. So they have disguises Sam makes for them, and I'm going to skip a bunch. He tries to pretend that there are some lost scouts. One of the guys knows the scouts that he's talking about, so it can't be them. And, and Sam's kind of like, okay, I'm Prince Samoth, and this is... And he tells them, page 275, an ancient terrible evil is being brought into Hatchel's sphere. We need it before it destroys the world. Okay, so dog's a friend. Do I have your permission because the dog speaks? 
And then Amaga goes, you know, can I talk to you since the dog can talk? I'm... <laughs> 276, the major says, you know, I would think you were guilty of overstatement, but I've lived here all my life. And... So what is this thing that's going to destroy the world? It's called the destroyer. That's kind of fitting. One of the night bright, nine bright shiners, free, free spirits of the beginning, bound and broken by the seven, very deep. And he goes, so that's what's causing it. Because what's been happening? Technology is stopping working, even more so than usual. Okay? There's been a lot of dead around. Okay? And he mentions Hedge. He goes, I knew a sergeant named Hedge. When I first joined, could be him, but this guy, I mean, that was 35 years ago. Well, we're going to find out. Hedge is over 100 years old. Been around a long time. At this point, are um, all the bells destroyed yet? The wind chimes? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Because a portion of one of those, the wind flutes, mm -hmm. a portion of one of those is going to become important later on. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, they make their way... Starting to head west, page 283 and 84. I've got a bunch of yellow, and I'm trying to figure out why. Uh, oh, yeah, that's why. Sam says, we need to send a message to my parents. Um, 283. Sorry, son. It happened almost a week ago. What? Uh, your parents are dead. They were murdered in Corver by Coraline's radicals. A bomb. Their car was totally destroyed. Sam listens, blank-faced. Mariel touches Sam's shoulder. The dog rests her nose on his right. Only Maga doesn't give a damn. <laughs> Lyriel spent the next few seconds walling off the news, pushing it down. Sam, when Lyriel says, don't think about it, it's up to us now. We have to get to Forward Mill. Don't think about it. Don't think about what? You just heard a minute before your mother and father are dead. Block it off. Mm -hmm. Won't suck it up, son. You know, but it's easy for her. She's never known her father, and her mom's been dead for 15 years. Sam, we can't. We might as well give up. He stopped himself in mid sentence, let his hands fall from his face, stood up, hunched over as if he were, had a pain in his gut. He stood there silently for almost a minute. Then he took the feather coin out of his sleeve and flipped it. It spun up to the ceiling of the blockhouse and hung there. He leaned against the wall to watch it, his body still crooked, but his head craned back. Eventually, he stopped looking at the spinning coin, straightened up, and said, I'm sorry. I'm all right now. Abhorson. That's his public acknowledgement. No longer in waiting. You're the real deal. Yes, I am that person. Ah, I know they don't like to get so I'm ready to go with me. Okay, so they go. I assume he catches the coin. He doesn't just leave it there spinning forever. Second interlude, blue postal van. Okay, which goes where? To the girl or the girl school. Wyverly College, where Sabriel went to school. Why are they going there? Is it reunion time? No, it's a safe place. Kind of. It's a relatively safe place. And charter right? magic can be done. And there's charter magic, and the students are, some of the students are taught charter magic. Okay? Yeah, the best ones. So they get there, and they have um, Sam's telegram, so they know about Chlor, they know about the thing being up, dug, dug up, etc. There aren't any paper wings, and they've gotten another message that says, whatever it is that's going to happen, it's going to happen on Anster Day. So pull out an almanac, and they figure out today is Anster Day. They've got to get to this four-wind windmill place today. Okay, So they talk about flying. Well, students are taught to fly. Some students are, and there's one girl named, what's her name? Felicity. Felicity can fly, and the magistrix, the headmaster, headmistress, sorry, she goes, no, you're not going to fly. What am I going to tell your 
parents if something happens to you. You're not. Sabriel, these are not ordinary times, top of 300. We must all do whatever we can. Thank you, Felicity. We accept. She's a student. What will I? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you'll tell her parents. I never know what to tell anybody. Except that it is better to do something than nothing, even if the cost is great. It's better to die how? Fighting. Fighting. Not giving up. And as she says this, she's looking out the window at an obelisk of white marble, an obelisk that was raised 20 years previously at the defeat of Caragor in the battle then, that has on the names of it names of friends of hers, names of Colonel, like Colonel Horace, who died, who had a daughter Samuel's age. And she's thinking, they did something. They didn't know we were going to win. We didn't know we were going to win. Right? So, they get on the plane, um, and notice what she has to tell Touchstone. How they're going to fly. Better man than I, because I go. I'm walking. <laughs> <laughs> they got to fly on the wings. There's handholds. I don't know, that'd probably be fun. As long as you're not 5,000 feet. I mean, 200 feet, yeah, that'd be fine. As long as you're tethered in, it would just be fine. And warm. <laughs> Think of going, you know, 150 miles an hour or something, you know, with a windbreaker. Ooh. Okay? So they go, yeah, and some goggles, because otherwise your face is going to be, you know, pockmarked with bugs. Okay, so they fly on. Um, Coming home to Anchelsteer, chapter 17, these, are, which is when, you know, the ships are coming, the barges are coming, and where we begin is with men on the, the lighthouse, the western light, which is on your map, okay? And the dead start coming up, and we're told, page 318 and following, Carrick, one of the, the light controllers, is supposed to be firing off these rockets every three minutes. Flares, essentially. Well, he's not doing every three minutes. He burns his hand on the first one. He's just dropping charges. And no, boom, boom. He's like mortars. Boom, boom, boom. Okay? But he dies. But the rockets had been observed, page 319, to the south and east. And in the light room, Lieutenant Drew came to and staggered to his feet as Carrick fell. He saw the dead in a flash of inspiration. He pulled the lever that released the striker and the pressurized oil. That is, he lights the lighthouse lamp, okay? which is magnified by all the mirrors behind it. And he gets it, and he turns the lamp so it's shining directly on the dead. Now, it doesn't kill them because they're already dead, but it makes them back off, and they fall down 100 feet to the base of the lighthouse, but because they're already dead, they're not dead. They're just mangled. But the parts that are unmangled enough start, you know, crawling back up and such. Okay. Nick wakes up, asks Hedge where they are. Hedge tells him. Page 324. He sees Hedge, and Hedge looks a little different than before. And he's plucked off the stretcher, wrapped in flame, tumbled down onto the stone floor of the tunnel. Because they're coming through, not on the barge. They're coming through from the Old Kingdom through the tunnel. Now, the hole that's been made through the, through the wall, which is a tunnel, is lined by the dead or by the people. And they're all on fire. They're all burning. And Nick notices... As he's being carried through, there's charter marks he'd heard about, Nick realized. The magic of Samath and Lyriel, page 325. And that makes him think about his conversation with Lyriel. He promised he would do whatever he could. The flames attacked his body, 
trying to attack what was in him, force the shard, but they can't. Where do the flames from? The walls. The wall. They're from the two parts of the charter, okay, the things that were used in the wall, the wall makers, etc. Okay? They keep trying to get him, and while they're working on him, he can think. His mind is not quite clear, but it's clearer, let's say. Okay? He gets through, Hedge catches him, and Nick thinks, I've got to stop this, I've got to stop this. Page 329. Hedge recognizes that Nick speaks with an independent voice. That is, the real Nick speaks. And says, your part is nearly done, Nicholas Sayre. You were never more than an imperfect host, though your uncle and father had proved to be more helpful than even I could have hoped. How? The plot against Savarella touched up. And sending all these southerners up. I mean, workers okay, who will work till they're dead. Hang on. Okay? Nick watched dully as Hedge walked away, bottom of 329. No independent thought was left to him. Only the burning vision of the hemispheres. Nick's hands fall to the ground on either side of the stretcher. One finger touches a piece of debris. He touches it, and he feels healing, and he feels warmth. He looks down at it, sees it's a piece of broken wood, a fragment of one of those smashed wind flutes, like the one whose stump he could see a few feet away, still infused with charter marks. And he thinks. For a moment he remembers who he was, and he remembers the promise. His right hand wouldn't obey, so Nick leans over with his left arm, tries to pick it up. He can for just a second, but then he drops it. So he's got to figure out how he's going to get this. Nick doesn't, uh, Hedge doesn't go too far away. Chlor uh, comes before. Let's see, we can skip all that. Pick up with. So they realize Chlor is coming towards them, 351. Lyriel says, I'll take the fight to Chlor. If I can defeat her, the hands may wander off, etc., etc. Dog says, you're not going alone. Sam says, I'm coming too. Moggett says, I'll come and watch. <laughs> Colonel Green, uh, Major Green says, I'll come. She said, no, you stay back here and help him. He goes, all right. <laughs> um, so Lyriel goes ahead and she calls out to Chlor. Chlor raises her shadow-bladed sword above her head, screams back in defiance. Lyriel orders her into death. Chlor hisses at her. The dog barks. Lyriel, you know, rings the bell, etc., etc. Uh, Moggett laughs at her and says, the abhorson comes to send you, and Chlor disappears. Chapter 19. Page 356, Lyriel asks, why did you tell her to run? I could have defeated her. And Margaret replies, it was quicker, which I thought was the point. What's he mean, it, that was the point? Which is, they've got to get where? To the hemispheres, to the lightning mill, okay? What was Chlor sent for? Roll them down. So, Moggett says, the ab is going to send you beyond the ninth gate. Chlor's out of there. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't want to. She's hanging on to that little bit of life. It was quicker, Sam says. In other words, Sam's kind of going, Moggett was right. Dog, you're not mistaken. So like my mistress, I'm not satisfied with Moggett's explanation or motivation. Okay? So they go on. Um, she's getting ready to go into death. She asks the dog, you'll come with me? Bottom 361, the dog. Wherever you walk, I will be there. And I don't know, but I bet you Nick's has in the back of his mind, because 
I think on the basis of this and the other books that he's written that I've read, he's pretty biblically literate. There's a passage in the book of Ruth that reads, Whither thou goest, I will go. Wherever you go, I will go with you. That's what the dog says to Lyriel. Okay? Um... Page 363. So, before they're going to go into death, the dog, you know, kind of stands guard again. Lyriel and Sam get a bit of shut-eye, because the dog says, you're going to need all your strength in the morning. And the dog walks over to Magen. Tell me why I shouldn't take you by the scruff of your neck and throw you off right now, the dog says. Margaret opens one eye. I'd only run behind. Besides, she, I notice she is capitalized, she gave me the benefit of the doubt. Can you do anything less? If Astorel, death, gave me the benefit of the doubt, shouldn't you? I am not so charitable. Let me remind you that you should you turn, that is, should you turn against us, that's what turn there means. I will make it my business to see that you are ended for it. Not bound. Done. Destroyed. Will you? What if you can't? <sighs> Low and menacing. Enough to wake Sam. I kind of think that implies, and I could be wrong, that the dog is more powerful than Mogget. That is, if they were two in their regular forms, the dog would, as a dog probably would, unless it's my daughter's miniature dog, uh, would, would wipe the floor with my okay? Is it ever said why the dog is so protective of Lirio? Nope. And it's never told why the dog shows up when it does, other than you needed me. But I think that you needed me goes back to at least over a thousand years ago when the Claire originally built the room for her. I think the dog's all part of the because it seems to me that there is somewhere there is a plan of sorts. You, you don't have prophecies and all that kind of stuff without there being someone delivering the prophecy, you know. Not the prophet, but the word being spoken, so to speak. Okay? So, um, Sam notice, uh, sorry, Nick notices in the stretcher something glowing. Okay? He's gotten up, but now he's come over the stretcher, because he sees the stretcher, and he sees it because he's so weak, he pulls one of the poles out, because he can use that as a walking stick. And he notices on the stretcher something glowing. He puzzles, he looks at it, and when he touches it, he gets sick to his stomach almost. And then he remembers, oh, it's that fragment. It's a wind or a fragment of a wind flute. He couldn't pick it up, for his hand refused to obey. Why? It's like matter, antimatter. Yeah, I mean, they're good, anti-good. But he could touch it. And as long as he touched it, He's himself. He was Nick Sayer. He wasn't the, pup, the word of a Sayer. I must stop this. So he can touch it. He can move it. He can't grasp it. But he thinks. Because as soon as he takes his finger off, he doesn't remember it anymore. And he looks down at his trousers, which he's still wearing. And his trousers, because he's really an Englishman. His trousers had cuffs on them, probably about one inch, maybe two inches wide, okay? And he could turn that cuff so it's like that. And he could get over next to the, next to the thing he could, and try and catch it so it's in there. It's not touching bare skin, but it's close enough to him that he gets the benefit of it, okay? So he gets it in. Until a few seconds later, the trouser cuff hit against his skin. Pain shot through his ankle, but it's bearable. So now, that little bit of wind flute with a little bit of the charter in it 
is counteracting the much, much, much more powerful bit of the destroyer that's in him. Okay? 370. Hedge comes up. Everything's going well, he says to him. Do you have any other instructions, Master? Nick felt something being in his chest, like a panicked heartbeat, only stronger, much more frightening and repulsive. He gasped at the pain that fell forward, his fingernails breaking as he tore at the wood. Hedge waits. Nick lay there panting. The thing within him, waiting for unconsciousness and the thing within him to take over. But it did not rise. It doesn't take over, and Hedge leaves. Nick rolls onto his back. He looks at the fog. But the greater part of his mind, page 371, was giving over, given over to something much more important. I gotta stop it. I gotta stop Hedge. So having the little bit of the wind flute is enabling him to stay in his clear mind. Chapter 20, beginning of the end. Dawn breaks. Okay. Hedge was somewhere down on the quay, page 379. And Lirio gets ready to draw out the bell from the bandolier. She's got the hema out. Her hand goes to Astorail. Dog goes, uh, not that one. We're too late to prevent the hemispheres from being joined. What does Astorail do? It sends everyone into death. Everyone, even the heroes. The dog says, won't do any good. These, these hemispheres are going to be joined. Oranus will be freed. Um, the destroyer's power is less constrained here. The destroyer is directing the lightning. Besides, the dead here are led by Hedge, not Clore. Okay, so they ask him, what about, she asks, what about Nick? Can't worry about Nick. He's beyond our help now. When the hemispheres join, the shard will burst from his heart. He'll know nothing of it. I hope it'll be swiftly and painlessly. You know, he'll be dead. Okay. She runs down, hurns, you know, traces down her, her steps, and she thinks, page 381, Perhaps Nick would have the easiest path. Maybe his death will be short and sweet. After all, it was likely he would be only the first to die unknowing. That is, everybody else, other than, you know, Lyriel and Sam and Major Green and some of the troops, everybody else is going to be completely, no pun intended, oblivious about their obliviation. They're, they're not going to understand it. That's, you know, if one of these things ever went off, I want to be right here. I don't want to be 10 miles away where you see it and then you know, oh shit, <laughs> because it's going to come. Well, at that point, you still can't do anything about it. Yeah, yeah but you have a few seconds. And the shockwave's going to mangle you. It's kind of, all right, go into our other radiation. The heat's going to kill you before the shockwave. Would, yeah, ten, depending on the size of the nuke, 10 miles away, you're going to be within a second, within a few seconds, okay? But still, here, it's just instantaneous, you know, you're part of the atmosphere. <laughs> a pretty part of the atmosphere, okay? So, they tell Sam what's going on, 383, Sam, but, but, but that means we're lost, I mean... Everything, the destroyer, Lario, no. We've not lost. It's not done. It's not. I'm going into death. I'm going to use the dark mirror. mirror. I'm going to figure out a way. Dog's coming with me. Okay, where's Moggett? Moggett says, I'm here. So they need Sam and Moggett to help protect their bodies. Lario, Moggett, help in any way you can. Notice what that is. It's a command of the Abhors. Notice, by the way, Moggett hasn't said anything about what he knows. Because what does he know that Sam and Lirio don't know? She's not Abhorsen. Moggett says, I always know when there is a new Abhorsen. That is, I always know when the old Hamorson dies. But he hasn't said anything. Well, 
Well, the old ab horse isn't dead. Well, isn't she still the ab horse in waiting? Doesn't he have to listen to the house, or does he only have to listen to the singular ab horse? Well, but she's not giving this command as ab horse in waiting, because Sam's already addressed her as ab horse. Margaret was there then. Margaret didn't, Margaret didn't go, hey, point of order here, can't she? <laughs> he doesn't, you know. Okay. So, any way I can, his confirmation sounded almost like a question. So, they go into death. And we're going to skip a bunch for the beginning, because we're going to skip most of, most of when they go into death. Page 400, the dog's like, I, I, I thought I heard something. He says, it's not Margaret. Whoever, whatever. Okay. Chapter 22. Oh, you're going to go now? Okay. Yep. That's fine. <laughs> Chapter 22. Uh, Nick's friend, Timothy Wallach, meets up with him. Says, what have they done to you? Have a good rest of the evening. That is where I got. Okay. <laughs> And he says, what are you doing? It's wrong. He tries to get Nick to help him. We have to get away. We have to stop this, etc., etc. Page 406, 407. Nick's thinking. He's, he's trying to keep his mind together. And so he does what Lyriel told him to do. Think of facts and dates and things like that. And he finishes with thinking of facts and dates like that. With father, help me. Mother, Sam, help me. Lyriel. Notice how he... When he does this kind of stuff, he always comes back to Lirio. He stops, coughs, he feels a chill run through his body, he lets it go. He still knows who he is, what he must do. And what's he thinking? I gotta get to those junction marks. I gotta get to the electrical panel. If I can shut down the lightning farm, okay, what's the problem though? That he's not aware of. Okay, that. That's the that's, not really a change that's a little theory. mundane problem. Mm -hmm. Who's causing the lightning at this point? Um, Orana says. I, I don't think the, shutting down a few wires is really gonna, you know. Does the, how much does the lightning farm help? Is the lightning farm a necessity or can they just join? Well, we're told here? the lightning farm, it's got something like a thousand poles, and each of the poles are connected by wires. Mm -hmm. It channels all the electricity into the two. I from what we described, I think Oranus probably can get, can direct the lightning right to itself. But do you think that was like a way to just get this an excuse to get the spears in there? Do you think they could have just could be, but I think that's originally that's part of Nick's quote unquote scientific mind. He's thinking, oh, it's electricity. I can channel that, or we can make a great big battery because mm -hmm. that's kind of what he's thinking this thing is. It's a giant battery. It'll power a lot of Priuses, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. So, Sam goes and tells the Southerlings, you can't come up here, Southerners. I promise you all this land in the old kingdom, just go away. And he gets them to believe him. Okay. Uh, Tim Malik meets up with Sam, tells him about the circuit breakers and such. Okay. And Margaret disappears. Chapter 23. They do away with Lathal, the abomination. Sabriel sends her beyond, uh, excuse me, Lyriel sends her beyond the night gate. Chapter 24. Margaret's inscrutable initiative. Nick falls back down to the ground. He's at the outside of the junction room, the electrical panel room, and he collapses. And he feels something licking him. Something touches his cheek. Gingerly opens his eyes, and there's a white flash of lightning, and there's a cat licking his face. Now, I'm sure you've all been licked by how's a cat lick different from a dog lick? They have razors on It's like teeth. sandpaper. Okay? Dogs are not like that. Go away, cat. And the cat speaks back to him. I've decided to take with you with me. Can you walk? Nick says no. The dog says, the cat says, I can take you. Okay. And so he kind of gets bigger and he gets Nick on his back. Uh, sorry, he comes the um, albino dwarf. So he picks him up and they walk off. Okay. 
Nick says, we've got to stop the thing. It's too late for that. Where, where are we going to go? We're going to go far away and we're going to watch it. <laughs> we're going to watch this happen. Okay. Page 435. Moggy shouts, the hemispheres join. He runs faster up the hillside, zigzagging between the lightning rods, body hunched over, to protect his burden from the violent energies that struck down all around them. Notice that. Moggit's doing what? He's protecting Nick. Okay. Ninth Gate, Chapter 25. So Lyriel and the dog, they keep going through. And page 443. Through the ninth and final precinct of death. Hold on. 442 at the bottom. She says to the dog, I want us to be together. And the dog looks up at her with a troubled eye, doesn't speak. When that was done, they strode off side by side. A few minutes later, stepped confidently into the wall of darkness that was the eighth gate. All light vanished. Lyra could see nothing, hear nothing, feel nothing. As if she'd suddenly become a disembodied intelligence. I was totally alone, totally cut off from all external stimuli. But she had expected it. And though she couldn't feel her own mouth and lips, her ears could hear no sound, she spoke the spell that would take them through this ultimate darkness, through to the ninth and final precinct of death. So notice... You don't just walk through the 8th to the ninth. There's a spell that takes you through. The ninth precinct was utterly different from all other parts of death. She blinked as she emerged from the darkness of the 8th gate, struck by sudden light. Familiar tug of the river at her knees disappeared and her faded away. The river now only splashed gently around her ankles and water was warm. Terrible chill that prevailed in all other precincts behind. Everywhere else at death always had a closed-in feeling like claustrophobia, due to the strange gray light that limited vision. Here, it's the opposite. There was a sensation of immensity. What's meant? Eternity. What did they say about Asterail? Death and time are closely related. There is no time in death. It's the, it's the opening out. Okay? And Lyriel could see for miles and miles across a great flat stretch of sparkling water. She could also look up and see more than a great depressing blur. Much more. There's sky up there. A night sky so thick with stars they overlapped and merged to form one imaginably vast and luminous cloud. I don't know if you've ever been anywhere before where you can see just a zillion stars. Growing up in California, my dad, my brother, and I went on a couple backpacking trips to into the Sierras, high Sierras, you know, it was a Yosemite, but we got way outside the valley. We got up to and spent the night one night on a ridge about 10,000 feet. And it was middle of summer and it snowed. It didn't snow much, but it, it snowed. But, you know, that's the highest I've been. Yeah, I think about 9,000 feet. And, you know, we're on our backs and look, and I mean, it's just like a blanket. Light. Just totally amazing. And at that altitude, I mean, you can just sit there and count the satellites. Just watch them go from horizon to horizon. This is even more than that. Okay? A multitude of stars. Lariel felt the stars call to her, and a yearning rose in her heart. She sheathed bell and sword, stretched her arms out up to the sky. What kind of image is that? That's praise, that's prayer. It's also, take me, you know. She felt herself lifted up. Her feet come out of the river. So she's, she's being lifted up. Dead rose too, she saw. Dead of all shapes and sizes. All rising up to the sea of stars. Some went slowly, some go fast. Some small part of Lyriel's mind warned that she was answering the ninth gate's call. The veil of stars was the final border, the final death from which there could be no return. You go from here, you don't go back. That same small conscience shrieked, got a job to do. Oranus, the destroyer, the dog, Sam, Nick, 
life. It angrily kicked and screamed, not yet, not yet. The cry was answered, though not by any voice. The stars suddenly retreated, became immeasurably far away, and she goes back. She blinks, shakes her head, falls several feet to splash down next to the dog, who still gazed up. Why didn't you stop me? Because the dog's just watching her. It is something that all who walk here must face themselves. Notice the dog looks up. The dog's not going. For everyone and everything, there is a time to die. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. I think it's chapter 4. There's a time for every season, a time to live, a time to die, a time to be happy, a time to mourn, a time to plant, a time to reap, etc., etc. The birds turned it into a beautiful song in about 1968. Some do not know it or would delay it, but its truth cannot be denied. Some do not know it or would delay it. Lord Voldemort in the Harry Potter stories. His name means flee from death. He's afraid to die. The ghosts in the Harry Potter stories are those who are afraid to die. The whole, I argue in my classes, the entire series is about one thing, learning how to die well. That is, to accept death. Hamlet does the exact same thing. Right? Hamlet says in one of his most you know, important, it's a little speech, and it's often overlooked. He says, the readiness is all. And he's talking about the readiness for death to be ready to die every moment. We saw it in Parkland last year, the high school in Southern Florida, when, you know, you had the kid, the shooter go in, but then we saw about four or five other students who did things like going up to the door and putting themselves in front of the door as the kid shot. I mean, there was one kid who lived, and he took like six bullets, right? And the coach, and a couple of the teachers, you know, who put themselves in front of others. Not when you look into the stars of the ninth gate. Its truth cannot be denied. Not when you look into the stars of the ninth gate. I'm glad you came back. She says, so am I. And Hedge bursts in. Right? And Hedge is stronger than her nose. I mean, she's not winning this battle until he trips. But that comes after she does the remembrance unit. And notice, six times, Lyriel saw a world destroyed. The seventh time, it's her own world. So she sees, apparently there are other worlds, she sees Uranus destroy seven worlds. Does that mean like their world, yeah. this is the seventh incarnation of, I think that's what it means. Yeah. There have been six other entire ecosystems. This is the seventh. All right? That's when Hedge comes in. All right? Hedge drops his sword and bell, page 454, and falls. And he claps his hands to his eyes as he struck the water. But he was just a moment too late. That is, he knows what he's going to see. So when he falls, he tries to put his hands over his face. But he's a moment too late and he sees the star. This passage, I think, is amazing. He saw the stars as he fell, and they called to him. Overcoming the weight of spells and power that had kept him in the living world for more than a hundred years. See, he's supposed to be dead. Always postponing death. Always searching for something that could let him stay forever under the sun. Why? He's afraid of death. He thought he had found it, serving Aramis, for he had cared nothing about anyone else or any other living thing. The destroyer had promised him the reward of eternal life and even greater dominion over the dead. Hedge had done everything he could to earn it. Now, with a single glimpse of those beckoning stars, it was all stripped away. What's the it was all stripped away? The self-concern, the narcissism, the dream of power, the desire to never die. Starlight filled his eyes with glowing tears. 
Why are the tears glowing? It's the light from the stars magnified by the water in the tears. Why tears? Have you ever, have you ever seen have you ever seen something so beautiful? It, it just makes your eyes water. I think that's what it is. I think it's partly that. And I think it's partly also an awareness and a, real, a realization. I should have come here sooner. Read stories about so-called immortality. Um... Alfred Lord Tennyson, poem called Tythonus, about a guy who's an immortal. And he wants to die, and he can't. X-Files actually did a fantastic episode back in the 90s about a guy who was an immortal. And in that episode, towards the end of it, there's only one way he could die. And he's, I think it is, uh, it's Mulder. He's begging Mulder to do this thing to him because he says, I'm tired of going on seeing People I love die. Because he's been alive for like 700 years from when he was born. And he's gone through family after family after family. And he thinks he dies at points. And then he wakes up. And he's new body. Same consciousness. Okay? Even Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings. The, the immortality of the elves. They don't have richer more beautiful, fuller lives. They're like ever-ready battery buddies. They just keep going on. Okay? The coils of steam wafted away. The river grew quiet. Hedge raised his arms and began his own notice. Fall towards the sky. Why fall? He's letting him go. He's letting himself go. You know, like, it, you might have to do sometime. You get a job a year. You get a corporate job. And you have to do, you know, corporate team building stuff. And you go off to the woods. And somebody, you know, puts you on a ladder or something. And go, all right, now trust your coworkers. They're going to they're gonna catch you when you fall off that 10-foot ledge. Okay? <laughs> so Hedge is gone. Sam and the Shadow Hands. I don't think I have anything really there. Sam fights him back. Moggett helps. Three paper wings show up. Okay. Lightning stops. Page 472. Tyndall. Well, there's the king and ab horse, isn't it? And Sam goes, and my sister Elamir, and two of the clear. Whole, whole gang's all back together again, you know? So. King, Abhorson, Claire, Wallmaker, which is both of these. So those five are all there. Plus Moggett, Uriel, plus Kibbeth. No. Only one, only one that's missing now really is Oranus. <laughs> okay. okay. So, Moggett shows up, 474, with Nicholas. And Nick says, uh, Sam says, it is my friend Nick. Moggett says, of course it is. Where's the app horse? 475. And Lyriel, we have to hurry. The hemispheres are almost joined. If we can get Nicholas farther away, the fragment will not be able to join, and the hemispheres will be incomplete. There's a scream. Nick's eyes flash open. The body jerks into rigidity. One arm points backwards towards the lock valley like a gun. Why? Because we were already told, I didn't talk about it, that piece that was in his heart started moving. And it started moving back the exact same way it came. Well, it came to his wrist. And so the arm reaches backward. And Free! The destroyer booms. Moggett. Too late. <laughs> he lays neck down. Nick bends over him, uh, Sam bends over him, tries to do some healing stuff. He realizes it's too late. He and Nick talk a little bit. Page 478. I'm sorry, I didn't know, Sam. I didn't know. 
What's he mean? Surface level is pretty clear. But what's he mean? And now he was like, cause the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, I was just trying to bring about, you know, the apocalypse. Okay, what else? I didn't know I was betraying your best friend. I mean, I think that I don't know. It's just packed. I didn't know there was real magic. It didn't fit into his worldview. What else? He didn't know he was possessed. Now he can't talk about it. Why? It's gone. And so what does he tell him? Back at the cricket match. That's when this all began. The sunken road. You went off into death. I remember I ran down the sea. Hedge was waiting. He thought I was you. He you know, put this thing in me. And then he says, Lyriel. Tell Lyriel I remembered. I tried. You can tell her yourself. She'll be here. You have to fight it, Sam. That's what she said. Okay? Sam tells them, Nick's dying. Healing spells won't. Lyriel, I know how to bind and break the destroyer. Sam, but Nick, we gotta save Nick. What's Lyrio thinking about? If we don't take care of the destroyer first, there's gonna be a hell of a lot more Nicks, right? Like the whole world full. There's nothing you can do for Nick. There's no time. I need, I need to tell you what must be done. Notice, she's not saying I can destroy. We have a chance, Sam. I didn't think we would, but the Claire did see who was needed, and they're here. We have to act now. Nick, do what she says. Try and make it right. What is Sam show what is Nick showing there? It's one of your topics that teach what are choosing. That's self-sacrifice. He's not saying, no, no, save me, save me. I mean, it's not a I'll go up and go kill the destroyer kind of self-sacrifice, but still. Okay? She tells Sam, you need to get a drop of blood from me, your parents, Elamir, Sanar, and Rael, and bind it with yours into Nahima with the metal from the pan pipes. Can you do that? No. I don't have a forge. Uh, magic. Hello. You're a wall maker, Sam. So Sam starts. Okay. Lyriel cuts herself. Sam cuts himself. Gets blood from his parents and stuff. And he starts doing the magic. He starts, you know, the charter stuff. Okay. Elamir, you know, kind of blames Sam. Now what have you done? Chapter 27. Excuse me, 28. Okay. Uh, so let's see here. Lyriel, 486, is giving out orders to Elamir, Sabriel, Touchstone, etc., etc. Um, the two twins... Claire say, just remember, you're a daughter of the Claire. You might not see, but, you know. In other words, they're kind of going, you know, we're involved in this too. We're helping save the universe. Herself, bottom 487. They get the three diamonds made around them. Herself, Samoth, Elamir, Sabriel, Touchstone, Sanar, Rael. That's seven. Not sure it was really the right seven. Lines of diamond shone, shone, gold and such. Sam still kneeling over his sword, doing all the stuff. The dog and Moggett are inside the diamond. And notice who else is. Moggett brings Nick in. Okay? Or the dog does. Dog does. So Lirio and Sabriel, while Sam's making the weapon, you know, they chat and get to know each other a little bit. Page 489. Lyrio says, I hope the diamonds will help protect us against the destroyer, but, you know. Lyrio calls Sabriel ab horse, and she goes, no, you just call me Sabriel. Okay. So Lyrio says, each take a bell. You'll know which one. Take the one that feels right. Okay. Each of us will be standing for one of the original seven as they live on in our bloodline and in the bells. So we find out who takes what. Sabriel, Sereneth for me, I think. Touchstone, Rana, sleeper, you know, it's appropriate since I slept for 200 years. Elamir, I'll take Dyram. Sanar and Rael say we'll hold Mosrael together in unison. 
Muriel thinks, hmm, maybe she didn't tell right. She could feel who should have which bell. That is, if one of them tried to take a bell they shouldn't have, she would go, hmm, maybe not. Maybe we should. Sam will have Belgare, and I, I will wield both Astereo and Kibbeth to make the seven. Don, who? I'll stand for myself. What? You said you weren't one of the seven. And the dog says, I lied. <laughs> Top of 492. Besides, I'm only what's left of Kibbeth. Not quite the same, but I'll stand against the destroyer. Okay? And as we hear destroyer's name said, the call of fire roared higher still, punched through the remnants of the storm clouds, more than a mile high now, dominated all the western sky. Sam's making the sword. He's a true inheritor of the wallmaker's powers, we're told. Elamir asks how long. Lyria, I don't know. I don't know. Notice they're not going up to Sam. How much longer? Like, how long is it going to take to get there? And all of a sudden, we see the destroyer, page 494, getting taller and stronger. Everyone jumped as Sam suddenly stood. They jumped again as he spoke seven master marks, one after the other. A river of molten gold, silver flame fell from his outstretched hands down upon Lyriel's bloody sword. And the panpipes, which he'd separated in his individual tubes, laid along the length of the blade. And then the destroyer flashes brighter. The ground rubble, and Daryl says, close your eyes. Why? Because that's the big boom. And they see the shining silver globe, if they had had their eyes open, go up to the top, and then poof. And notice how long. Yeah, I saw that. For nine very long seconds, Lyriel waits. I don't know what the difference is between a long second and a short second because a second's a second. But if you're into Einstein and theory of relativity, <laughs> it a lot depends on what you're doing, doing doing during those nine seconds. Okay, time is relative after all. The explosion came as she counted nine. A blast of white hot fury. This is why he told me this is a nuclear explosion. White hot fury that annihilated everything in the lock. The mill, the railway, were vaporized in the first flash. The lock boiled dry an instant later, sending a vast cloud of superheated steam. Rocks melted, trees became ash, the birds and fishes simply disappeared. The blast sheared the top of the ridge completely off, destroying earth, rocks, lightning rods, everything else. Outermost diamond of protection, gone. Okay. Second diamond lasted a couple seconds, then it was gone. The third and final diamond held for more than a minute. And then they see a big, huge cloud of dust, ash, steam, and destruction where they're climbing thousands of feet till it spread out like a toadstool on top. And Lyriel's the first one to open her eyes. She sees ash falling. Protect yourselves against the heat so they do charter magic. And Sam holds the blade. Not sure if what he's made is right. And now the blade simply says, Remember Nehemiah. Well, what's Nehemiah? Okay, we've got one, two, three, four, five. Is Astriel actually one of these? Or is Nehemiah one that's no longer... I don't, I'm, I'm asking. I may, I may have forgotten something. It's, I'm, I'm literally asking. I thought it, was it, it was the sword, but why uh, would you hold the sword and say, remember Nehemiah? Uh, anyways... Binder, yeah. So, Sam says, is that it? Did I make it right? She says, yes, Lyriel. So she tells Sabriel, give Belgari Sam, tell him the binding spell. Okay. So they walk, they go down to where, they walk down to where the silver, hemis, the silver ball is. And they make a ring around it. Notice, it's not small enough where they're holding hands and singing kumbaya. They're making a big ring around it with these seven people. Okay. Lero says, make a ring around it. And as the flames rise, page 500, Arana speaks. Hedge failed me, as all living things must fail. Till silence rings me in eternal calm across a sea of dust. 
And now another seven comes, all a clamor to lock Uranus once more in metal. But can a seven of such water to blood and thinner power prevail against the door destroyer, last and mightiest of the nine? I think not. Okay. So Lyriel speaks. I stand for Asterail against you. She sketches a charter mark with the tip of the sword. Okay. Sabriel draws a mark. I stand for Sereneth. Sam, I stand for Belgair. And he thinks of Nick. Elamir, I stand for Diarum. The dog, I, I stand for myself, you know. <laughs> as I did then. Okay. But she doesn't draw a charter mark or body ripples, brown dog skin giving way to a rainbow of marks. St. Arn Rael, we stand for Mosrael against you. Touchstone, I am Torgan called Touchstone, I stand for Rana against you. He draws his mark. And then Lirio swings her bell. So they make the mark, and then they swing the bell. She swings her bell, notice which is Astrael, so it should make all the hearers, but it doesn't. She swings hers, and all the others start to swing theirs. On and on the bells go, till they seem to echo everywhere. She speaks the rest of the binding spell, and the ring around Uranus grows brighter still and begins to tighten, that is, it shrieks. Okay? The dog's bark keeps going on. Uranus says, no. Notice 505, its voice calm, devoid of all emotion. Why? Puny little humans. It's kind of what Aranus is saying. 506. Too long did I linger in my metal tomb. Too long have I borne the affront of living, crawling life. Notice, life is an affront. It personally, you know, makes me ill. I am the destroyer and all will be destroyed. She, Lyriel, now, had seen the beginning, seen her on its bound, she seen before how the seven had prevailed. Here, they'd failed. Why? Well, I mean, what did Arana say? You know, the blood, it's, it's thinned and watered down. But then in the midst of despair, Lyriel heard Sam speak, 507, and saw a flash of brilliant light flow up next to him to form a tall shape of white fire that was only vague human. Be free, Moggett. Choose well. Sam reaches behind. Moggett's in his pack and just pops the collar. Does Sam know what Moggett's going to choose? This is the biggest roll of the dice in the world. Well, I mean, if, they, if, if Moggett doesn't help, they still die. If Moggett attacks them, they still die. So the only other option is like, you know, might as well. Yeah, so the options are, you know, they roll the dice and Moggett helps, or they roll the dice and Moggett says, bye. <laughs> the shape of fire grew taller, turned away from Sam, towards Sabriel. Why? Abhorson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Issues there. Its head descended as if it might suddenly bite. Sabriel looked at it, up at it stoically, like, really? <laughs> And hesitated, then it flowed over to Lyriel, Abhorson. She felt the heat of it and the shock of its own free magic. Please, Moggett. Too soft to be heard by anyone else, but the white shape did hear. It stopped and turned inwards to face Uranus. I am Irael, or Yrael, however it's pronounced, casting a hand out to throw a line of silver fire into the breaking spell ring. I also stand against you. Now, but this, I know it's been bound for a long time. And Moggett said earlier, I'm not what I once was, but it's still pretty powerful. And the ring tightens. As the ring tightened, tongues of flame blew out. The sphere grew darker. It begins to glow with a silver sheen. Silver are the hemispheres that had bound Uranus for so long. And now Iriel was singing along with the other bells. The sphere contracted still further, the silver spreading through it like mercury spilt in water, traveling in slow coils. 
when it became fully silver, Lyrio knew she must strike. She gets the sword, chops it in two. Okay? Why, Ariel, Aranus cries out, why? Why would you join with them? Notice, the last time this happened, Lyrial wasn't there, Ariel wasn't there to join. Why? Had already been bound. I think that's because they probably had a pretty good idea of which way Ariel would choose. Because Ariel did not choose to do this. Okay? Which is interesting because neither did the dog, really. Life. Ariel's answer seemed to travel across a great distance, great space, words trickling into Lyriel's consciousness as she raised her, horse, her sword still higher, body arching back. Life, who was more embodied than it ever knew. Fish and fowl, warm sun, she, trees, the field mice in the wheat under the cool light of the moon. All the, and Moggett doesn't finish before Lyriel gathers up all her sword, all her courage, and strikes. Sword met silver metal with a shriek that silenced everything. The blade cuts through. Sword melts. Red fire streaks up into Lyriel's hand. Why? That's Aranus trying to escape. It's trying to come into Lyriel. She screamed as it bit, but hung on, putting all her weight and strength and fury into the blow. She could feel Aranus in the fire, feel it in the heat, seeking its last revenge on her, filling her with its destructive power. Lyriel screams. The flames engulf the hilt, which her hand is connected to, her hand now no more than a lump of pain. Still she holds on. Why? She's willing to sacrifice that hand to make sure Aranus is bound. Sword breaks through. The sphere splits. Even knowing she would fail, she tried to let go. Okay? But she can't. Aranus had her. Spirit kept momentarily hold by the thin bridge of her sword, the last remnants of the blade between the hemispheres, a bridge to her destruction. And she screams for the dog. And what does the dog do? Because she can't let go. Why? Her fingers were welded to the metal. And Aranus was in her blood, spreading through to consume her. Okay, by saying welded, it's slightly inaccurate. I've been on fire before. I've had third degree burns to the bone in my leg. Her flesh is melted to the sword. It, it's her, her flesh is the sword at this point. Okay, and what does a dog do? Bites the hand off. Wait, doesn't welding mean like melting two things together so that they become one? Yeah. I know but you, you don't talk together. about flesh as welding. You talk about it melting or something. It's usually just the same. Too. Yeah, yeah. There's a new pain, but a clean one. Sharp, sudden. Aranus was gone. The fire threatened to destroy her. A moment later, Lyra realized, oh, you're bitten off her hand. <laughs> All that remained free of Aranus's vengeful power was directed at the disreputable dog. Red fire flowered about her as she spat out the hand throwing it between the hemispheres. Great god of flame erupted, engulfed the dog, sending Lyriel stumbling back. The hemispheres hurled apart, one narrowly, narrowly missing Lyriel, tumbling past her into the lock in the returning sea, the other up past Sabriel, bound and broken. She goes to the dog. The dog's lying on her side with the sphere had been upon a bed of ash, her tail wags, the dog's all burned. Dog didn't seem hurt, but Lyriel saw words. Well, that's done. I gotta leave now. No. 512. There will be other dogs, friends, and loves. That's a hint, by the way. You have found your family, your heritage. You've earned a high place in the world. I love you too, but my time with you has passed. Goodbye, Lyriel. And then she was gone. And there's the little soapstone figurine that she found way down in the library. Right. Epilogue. Nick stood in the room. Where? Death. Watched with interest as the, he's standing there, water's blowing, you know, rushing across his knees. He's like, huh, wonder where I am. He thinks about lying down and just. 
After a time, it could be minutes, hours, days. He sees the dog. You're the, wait, was that a dream? You had wings, it had to be a dream. I'm the dog. Pleased to meet you, Nick says. The dog offers a paw, Nick shakes it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know where we are? We're dead. You died. This is death. Okay. Um, hemispheres. Aranus has been bound anew. It is once again imprisoned in the hemispheres. In due course, they'll be transported back to the old kingdom. He's like, oh, God. Sam and, and Lyriel? Alive? They live. Though not without scathe. My mistress lost her hand. Samoth will make her one, of course. A shining gold, clever magic. Lyriel Golden Hand. That's the next book. Just titled Golden Hand. She'll be forever after. Remembrance her an app horse and much else besides, but there are other herbs which, which require different remedies. She is very young. Stand up, Nicholas. What's he implying? You're going back for her. Okay. I gave you a late baptism. When did he get the baptism? When they thought Nick died, the dog came up and touched his nose to his forehead. You bear the charter mark on your forehead now to balance the free magic that lingers in your blood and bone. That is, Uranus is gone, but you still got that taint. You will find charter mark and free magic both boon and burden, for they will take you far from Anchelsteer, and the path you will walk will not be the one you have thought, long thought to see ahead. And I've got Golden Hand at home, and I, I guess I haven't read it tonight. Totally, I have no recollections of any of this. Because he's, she's, he's got to come in the book because of what he says here. What do you mean, far from Angel Steer? How can I? I'm dead. He's like, because when you're dead, you're dead, right? You don't come back. I'm sending you back. How can the dog do that? Dog's not a necromancer. But what's the dog? And all he's got to do is turn you around. <laughs> Walk! Is this allowed? No. But I'm their disreputable dog. <laughs> that is, I do what's not allowed. <laughs> Nick takes another step. And he smiled as he felt the warmth of life, and the smile became a laugh, a laugh that welcomed everything, even the pain that waited in his body. In life, his eyes look up, he sees the sun. A white cat suddenly appears next to Nicholas's feet. He sniffs in disgust. Why? <laughs> Is it because he you know he's alive? He smells the smell of the dog on him. I might have known. But notice the interesting part of that. The white cat. What has Maga done? He's intentionally and willfully taken that form. He's not been rebound. He looked past Nick at something that wasn't there and winked and trotted off in a northerly direction. Cat was followed a little later. Nick manages to hand and wave. The disreputable dog sat with her head cocked to one side for several minutes. Her wise old eyes seeing much more than the river. Her sharp ears hearing more than just the gurgle of the current. After a, smile, after a while, a small, enormously satisfied rumble sounded from deep in her chest. She got up, grew her legs longer to get her body out of the water, shook herself dry. Then she wandered off, and this I found this very interesting because it, it, it's left me puzzled. She wandered off following a zigzag, zigzag path along the border between life and death. Her tail wagging so hard, the tip of it beat the river into a fog behind her. How, how can you be between life and death? Especially, I mean, what's the description? She's in, it sounds like death. And when the dog sat with her head cocked to one side for several moments, her wise old eyes seeing much more than the river, what's she seeing? Is she seeing in the life? Is she seeing Nick? And the others coming up around him? Mogget. Mogget, you know, damn dog. <laughs> but maybe since 
time and death are intertwined. If she's walking, zigzagging between life and death, maybe popping in and out of time for people that she needs to help. That's kind of kind of what I think, because I think Kibeth is kind of like Asterail in that sense. You know, Lyriel, when, when the dog shows up, Lyriel essentially asks, where'd you come from? Or, you know, why now, why me, etc. And the dog says, you needed me. The dog kind of, you know, just implies, when I'm needed, I show up. Okay, well, Mogget kind of says, the same kind of thing about Asterail. Asterail, he says, you know, he gave me a second chance, knew I needed it. So when we see Maga at the end, notice he's free, but he does what? He takes this form of subservience almost. Well, I just erased them. What did the five do when they entered the ab horses, the clare, the royalty, and the wall. We're told they poured themselves out. They emptied themselves into these things. Geysers. They became servants of these beings, these creatures, these things. Do you think Uranus is inevitable? And since the blood line is weakening, the next time he comes back, that's it? Well, you know, in a lot of, I can think of several fantasy series that essentially make that kind of statement. In the Harry Potter series, in the first book, Harry Potter says to Dumbledore, you know, I've only defeated Voldemort for a time, right? I mean, he's going to come back and Dumbledore says, yeah. And, you know, and it may be that you defeat him for a while and, and others will have to defeat him for a while. In the Lord of the Rings, you know, um, Gandalf says, evil is never totally destroyed. The shadow always takes another form after a while. It'll just take somebody else to fight it and defend it, defeat it then. And even in the essay on fairy stories, he says, you know, it's the long defeat. That is, here in this world, there is always evil to confront. Okay? And it, it, one of the things that seems to me a lot of fantasy authors are doing is they're wrestling with that primal good versus evil conflict. And how, you know, I think I've put up here on the board, all that is necessary for evil to thrive is for good men to do nothing, or for good people to do nothing, for good men to do nothing, okay? Think throughout the these books how often someone like Sam in particular wants to give up. And something happens and his spine gets stiffened. Yeah, big China. I mean, think of those kids who are currently holed up in that university. I mean, they've, they've turned it into a city, you know? Thank my opinion. Thank God the Senate passed unanimously the resolution supporting Hong Kong. Word came, Marco Rubio said today, the president might sign it. Well, if he does, because the House already passed a similar bill, if he does, that's a pretty strong incentive, you know, for other nations, et cetera, to do something. What's really disgusting, and this is kind of related, but a little off topic, you know, we, we've got all these press reports. We know about these Chinese concentration camps of Muslims, the Uyghurs. There's 500 of them. You know who, who has publicly come out and supported China's right to do that? Russia, Belarus, um, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan. I mean, what gives? And there is talk about in those camps they're doing organ harvesting okay, on live people. That is, they're not dead yet. And they're pulling out livers and kidneys and lungs and... Okay. So, you know, this idea really permeates a lot of fiction, an awful lot of fiction. Why? Because it's real. This is attributed to an 18th century British um, kind of the father of conservatism. You know, same thing was said, you know, about Nazi Germany. How were the Nazis able to do everything they did? Because the Nazis, the members of the Nazi party did not outnumber everybody else. 
Same thing in the Soviet Union. The members of the Communist Party did not outnumber everybody else, but everybody else was so afraid. Okay. All right, we'll stop there. Thank you all. You hearty few. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. I did.